What's up, everybody? How you doing? I'm Mike Watson, and I'm your host on Chat and Draw. And in case you're wondering what that is, Chat and Draw is a little show that I like to call Chatting and Drawing, where I literally sit across from the virtual art table from my guest on the show, and I chat with them as I draw something that we are perhaps more than likely talking about on this show. In case you want to know a little bit of background about me, a little bit of history, a little bit of resume, I happen to be the publisher of Short Fuse Media Group. I am the founder of Freestyle Comics, one-fourth of the agents of the nerdy, and the most enthusiastic person in comics. It's been a while since I've done that. Last week was a super busy week for me, guys. A um, ton of work came in, and my day gig was really slamming hard on the artwork. Um, the 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 digital pad was really working and had to do some traditional work uh by hand as well um but what did come in for me oh yeah that chat and draw shirt baby i got it in the white and i got it in that good old red right there look at that oh that's fantastic these shirts are available right now on my t republic store on my t public store go check it out go get it matter of fact let me help you out with that because uh what's up katie how you doing now, if I am right, no, I did not do it correctly. Let me see here. We'll see if that works. Either way, I'll find out to get that link in there. What's up, J-Man? How you doing? Welcome to the show. J-Man has been, uh, he has watched every single show since I debuted. This is the 134th episode of Chat and Draw. We're in the building. We're in the business. We're out here making it happen. That's what we do. Now. Few things to get out the way. See these right here? I have about 70 of these packed up. All right? Packed up with contents, goodies, goodness coming to y'all. I've got the print, the shipping labels. Put them on there, close them up, and take them to the post office. This Kickstarter is almost done. And then after that, we're going directly into the next Kickstarter, which is the hot shot trade um i'm also gonna be doing the uh let me see here. i'm also gonna be doing the kickstarter rundown on um, some kickstarters i think that you should be checking out because they're awesome all right all right so let me see here first off i got my man ted sakura dude I, I really appreciate this guy he got his books already and uh he put up a nice video talking about the quality of the art books for season one two and three uh and you know almost made a guy cry you know what i'm saying I put a little tear in my eye and everything but uh ted has bloom number two one and two and yes that is correct he just launched the bloom one a couple months ago he's already got the second issue out you guys need to go over there and go check that out uh if you've already pledged to it then give it a share because sharing means you care and you want these comic books from these indie people to get out here next up is unlikely hero studios we got the surgeon number four and if you know anything about watching my show, you know I absolutely love that book. It is a great post-apocalyptic book with a nice little variation on that story. So please go out there, go check that out. If you have not pledged to it, then give it a share. If you haven't pledged to it, go ahead and pledge to it. Uh, next up, we got uh, Lumberjacks, which is under my publishing house, under Short Fuse Media through uh, Fourth Wall Productions. They are almost at eight grand, I believe so. Uh, either eight or seven, but either way, let's keep the money coming. It's still got about 12 more days left on that Kickstarter. If you have not pledged, go pledge. If you have pledged, go ahead and give it a share. Like I said, this is just real quick, real fast. This is the indie Kickstarter rundown with me in a minute or two under the wire. Next up, we got renderings with Ren McKenzie, my brother, his art book, smashing the Kickstarter walls. If you like uh, fantastic art with a uh, traditional twist, on it of all types of characters from your from your childhood, from fandom now, comic books, all that. This art book is, oh, I believe it's over 100 pages. It's ridiculous. Um, and it is going hard on Kickstarter. So please check, check it out. Yes, Jeremy, hope has arrived because you are here, man. Thank you so much for joining us and tuning in to us. Uh, and that is all I got right now. Uh, we're going to leave it at that. Brad says, when are we going to get some Spider Squirrel info? Spider Squirrel info. Uh, I'm, I'm holding off on that. We we I believe we got the launch page up. Charlie has been killing it. Uh, but that info is going to be coming real, real, real soon. Charlie is doing a fantastic job putting that together. Brad, leave it to you to be on these indie streets with all these comic books and stuff. 
All right, I got one last announcement before we get ready to dig into this show. So if you've been paying attention and seeing my time stream, I have partnered up with Indie Comics Dispatch for the Versus episodes. We were just in these indie streets, minding our own business. Indie Comic Dispatch was across the street. I was on the other side of the street. Indie Comic Dispatch was doing these versus matches with these voting and these polls. I was doing versus matches with bringing creators onto the show and drawing their characters. And we looked at each other. We caught each other's eye. We saw our attention. Bam! And we joined forces. And when we joined forces, when Indie Comics Dispatch and Chat and Draw joins forces, your question is, what happens? This is what happens. <laughs> You see that? <laughs> That's our first match. Oya versus Ether. Um, April 24th, 8 p.m. We're getting in. Brian, uh, Brian's going to be here to co-host with me. I'll be drawing these characters up. Brian, the cool thing about this, man, the cool thing about this is Brian, you guys are going to vote. So you go to the Indie Comics Dispatch website. You vote on which character you want to win, right? Uh, then when the voting is all done, they come on my show. I draw the two characters fighting, and we talk about that or whatnot. And then after that, when we show the voting um, results, Brian has written a story based off the results of the votes on how that character won. I mean, where else can you get so much goodness of indie indiness? I don't know, but right here. So tune in because we got all that popping. Make sure I check this right here. J-Man said sweet. All right, but enough is enough. It's time to get into the show. We're coming around to the final couple characters that I need to add to this Kickstarter team up. Of, of, of enormousness that happened between Wizard World and a bunch of other creators. And so we're about to get right into that right now. Enough of a delay. Let's quit talking about it. You notice I'm stalling because I'm looking for my video. There it is. Here comes a new challenger. <laughs> Chill. Chill. I think it's time for me to save the day. Charlie, hey. I I, I, I'm doing great. I don't know if I can quite match the enthusiasm that you've been bringing so far on the stream, but I'm going to do my best. Uh, I, I mean, it is, it's episode 134, right? I mean, if yeah. you can't kill it for episode 134, what can you bring the enthusiasm for? Hey, all I do, all I ask is you bring your best, sir. That's all I ask. Yeah, I know. I'm really happy to be here. Thanks so much. I, I really appreciate you having me on. Oh, no problem. I, I'm happy that you're on here. Uh, I This will be my first actual, outside of our email transgressions, this will be my first interaction with you and knowing you as a creator. So I'm going to give you a few minutes to go ahead and talk about who you are, what you're into, and what you're doing with brought you to the show. Let's educate everybody to who you are. So, hey, I, I'm Charlie Stickney. I am a comic book writer. Uh, I also am co-publisher over at Scout Comics, but as a creator... I'm most known for building the White Ash universe. Uh, White Ash is a fantasy romance uh, grounded comic uh, set in a coal mining town in Western Pennsylvania. Um, the, the quick pitch for that is um, Romeo and Juliet meets Lord of the Rings in, you know, in coal mining country. Uh, the other way thing I like to say is, you know, if the guys from Super, Supernatural got stuck in Riverdale, but uh, instead of having to battle demons from hell, they had to deal with the worst of Mordor. Um, so, you know, it's, it's grounded fantasy. That's kind of what I do. Ground fantasy set in the real world. And, um, you know, I've, I've done, I think at this point, six or seven Kickstarters based on uh, just White Ash proper. And then most recently, uh, I just started a new spinoff series called uh, Glarian, which is what we'll be working on today, um, you know, trying to expand that universe out. And so this is, this is a big epic story that I'm, I'm going to be telling for a long time. Uh, it's slated for about 60 issues uh, in terms of the comic. And uh, I've got several mini series that are going to help fill out some of that backstory. So, um, you know, I, I like to, you know, as, as they say, go big or go home. Uh, I'm, I'm going really big and I'm hoping I don't have to go home. So, um, yeah, so no, I, I've been um, really enjoying, uh, you know, fleshing out that universe. Uh, on, on White Ash, I work with Connor Hughes, who is, um, you know, my amazing partner uh, over there. Um, and uh, he's, he's the line artist on White Ash and, and the co-creator in the book. 
and also Finn Cram, who does the colors. Uh, on Galarian, I'm working with Romano Morinelli, who's incredible as well. Uh, and she does a lot of her own color work, but uh, Finn is also doing uh, the color work for that. And the, and the quick pitch for, for Galarian, um, you know, we get to know her in, in the White Ash universe, but this is um, a story that's set both in, um, you know, in, in Alfheim 3,000 years ago when we're seeing her, uh, when she's basically like 18 to, to 22. Um, but also it takes place in 1970s New York City where uh, a young woman named Rachel, who recently went through all kinds of trauma, is having flashbacks to being Glarian. And so over the course of the series, we're, we're telling Glarian's history through this young woman, Rachel's eyes, and we'll see how these two stories kind of come together by the end of the miniseries. Um, and, and, you know, and Glarian, and she's, she's basically like uh, my version of Red Sonja mm -hmm. um, or, or Conan. Um, I, I really like those characters that are, um, I think, I think there's something, especially in fantasy, there's something epic about the character that is so, um, so confident in themselves and their abilities where, you know, they are a primal force onto themselves where they feel no fear because they think they can handle any situation. And then something comes, which makes them question, you know, that confidence they have in themselves. And that's kind of where this story starts. Um, so, you know, it's, it's for her, it's, 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 um, you know, sowing her oats, uh, it's, it's her journey from being, uh, a young warrior to basically being a legend, um, that we're pairing with this, this story set in 1970s New York city, which keeps the whole world grounded and kind of tied to our white ash universe. Um, and, uh, you know, for me with this kind of storytelling, what I like to do, um, is, is make it feel like this could have happened, that it's, it's, it's in our world. But, you know, just the way Harry Potter is or the magicians, you know, sh shows that are set on the fringes of our of our world and th those fantastic elements start slowly creeping in. Um, but with this backstory, with like this is a standalone miniseries that anyone can jump on board with. But it's also fleshing out some of the White Ash universe. So if you like White Ash, you know, proper, you're going to love this because it fills in a lot of those uh, pieces in the background. Um, so, yeah, so, uh, so that's so that's kind of what I'm doing. I'm, I'm working on that. I have another. Um, sci-fi series called The Game, uh, which mm -hmm. we're a couple issues into. Um, and uh, the next Kickstarter for that will be coming out uh, in a couple of months. Um, and, uh, you know, I mean, for me, I think Kickstarter is is a great place for, for creators to access the fans directly and build a fan base. And then I often put on my, uh, you know, publishing hat and then go over to Scout, where we distribute things into comic book shops and sort of uh, reach both worlds. Um, of fans, because I think there's a very rabid um, fan base on Kickstarter that's actually different than um, the people who go to the comic book shops, the Wednesday Warriors, and each of them are different, interested in different things. And so I try to serve both of those audiences with different offerings, both on Kickstarter and you know through the direct market. That's awesome. That's, uh, I, I I agree with all that. First off, damn, uh, love the gusto um, sixty issue book that you have planned out uh, for this. That uh, that's large in scope and scale, exciting and scary all at the same time. What is the thought process for you to say, like, how do we get there? Like, how did we get to saying six, around 60 is my mark for what I want to do for this? Well, I, I, I think for me, it's, um, I mean, my background, um, my background was when I was in high school and early in college, I wanted to go into comics. Mm -hmm. And then I somehow ended up in the entertainment industry, working in animation, working uh, in independent film, in, in feature film, things like that for a while. And then I came back to comics. So, so for me, when, when I'm looking at writing something, it's always kind of like dual track. Like if, if this is a comic book, you know, what would the version of this, this thing be? If it was a TV series, what's, what's the version of it? If it was a movie, what's the version of it? Cause I think, you know, you can take an idea and, and you can parse it out into different, different um, formats, different media, and, and you need to treat the story differently for each of those. That said, you know, when I'm thinking about it as a TV show, if, if you were to write a TV pilot, you don't want to just go in with a pilot. You have to sort of flesh it out and say, this is what the first season would be. This is what the second season would be. This is what the third season would be. Because, you know, when you're trying to sell a show, you want to make sure that, you know, that the studio has confidence that there's a story that's going to continue. 
Mm-hmm. So, you know, so, so when I am building a world, it's, or building a comic, it's, I can't just look at that small arc, that first issue. I have to think of what's this world? What's this show? So for White Ash, I said, okay, here's my first arc. This is what it's going to be. And assuming it does well, you know, this is where I would go from there. Um, you know, if it was a TV show, this is what my pilot would be. This is what mm-hmm. season one would be. Here's how season two would be different, you know, pushing the bar. Here's how season three would be. So as a TV show, I kind of roughed it out for about five seasons, um, which then translated it into, you know, roughly, um, you know, 12 issue uh, comic. You know, each season was like kind of a 12 issue um, arc of the comic. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and, and so like, that's kind of where that 60 issues, five issues equals 60 seasons to tell this big epic story. That said, I think you have to be pragmatic about when you're making a comic book, when you're making anything and thinking, I might never get there. I might not get past like five or six. So, you know, I, I've structured the story with natural breaks. Um, so the first one, you know, like the first White Ash that we did, which I, I, I brought to Kickstarter and then we did a hardcover and then that was a six issue series that came out through Scout. That feels more or less like a complete story. So if people hadn't liked it, you know, we could have kind of just left it there, but that's never where I wanted it to go. So from there, um, you know, there's been you know, a, a growing fan base for the book. Um, so, you know, as we're going into this next arc um, of White Ash, um, I, I, I'm looking at two more arcs to sort of complete out the first storyline. So, mm. so now it's like the first it was, if I can get six issues, I'm, I'm going to feel good. Now oh. we're going to go at least 18 but the plan is to still always get to 60. So as long as you know people are coming along, but you, you, I think as a creator, you have to structure in points where you can say, okay, if I can't do more, people are not gonna feel like they didn't get a good story. Um, mm. so, so I'm always like kind of just tracking those different things. Um, but then we just launched this Galarian Kickstarter, which went berserk. Um, I mean, I, I can't, um, you know, I can't understate how you know, um, humbled I was by all the people who came out to, to back that campaign. Uh, you know, we, we had so many, you know, people always talk about like, what kind of money did your Kickstarter raise? Like for me that, you know, that's always the thing that you need to make the book. But for me, what's more important is how many backers come out. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And, you know, like when you see this outpouring of fans that are coming to Kickstarter that are saying, oh, you know, even like in, in terms of like backers, if you look at like single issue comics on Kickstarter, it was top 10 all time in terms of backers who came out for this comic mm-hmm. book. So, you know, we, we had, we had a huge, huge outpouring of fans. So I feel very confident that, you know, not only we're going to be able to, you know, do this Glarian mini series, but there'll be more Merrick Glarian down the road that, that the white ash universe is only, you know, just getting bigger. Um, and, and then again, I mean, I'm fortunate because I'm also co-publisher over at scout, so I'm able to access, you know, we've got uh, the trade coming out this summer through Scout, and that's going to also be in, in, you know, comic comic book shops, but also through our, our distribution deal with Simon and Schuster. That'll be in bookstores everywhere. So for me, um, it's a very exciting time. But Kickstarter is where I like to go to have access to the fans and kind of give them, you know, first chance at these exclusive print runs um, and, and and connect with people because I think I think. W- what I mean, and you've done Kickstarters too. What I really love is when you see someone who you know has backed five of your projects on Kickstarter, and you've yeah. maybe never met them in real life, but you see their name in the backers list of um, different Kickstarters, and you know what you're doing is working for people. And I and I think um, a, as a creator, when you work with a publisher, you never know. You never know who those fans are. Are they collectors? Are um, they just fans of the publisher? But through Kickstarter. Uh, th- through that venue, you get a you get that real connection with your fans, and you're able to build an audience and and, and give them something truly special because because you, you're really just creating it for them and for you. You know, you're, you're creating the story the way you want it, and giving it to the people who like the story that way. Awesome. Um, <laughs> you're just dropping nuggets, man. I'm just sitting here listening to you drop all the all this nuggets and experience. Um. Let's switch it up for a second and let's uh, talk about your origin story. Well, how did you even get into comics to begin with? 
Well, if, if, if we want to go back to, um, you know, my pre getting bitten by a radioactive spider days. Yeah. Um, you know, like I, way back in the day, um, I, I had this giant cardboard box filled with comics and I don't know where they came from. I think my parents used to just buy me three packs and things when I went on, um, you know, when I went on trips with them just to keep me quiet in the back seat. They're like, here's some Wonder Woman. Here's, you know, some Batman Brave and Bold pack. Here's a couple issues of Spider-Man. So, you know, so I, I, I like those. I, I loved Spider-Man and his Amazing Friends, which was a cartoon that was on in the mid to early 80s. Um, and, and, you know, like, so like, I, I, I like the culture a lot. Mm. Uh, you know, I like the, the Super Friends cartoon, but I wasn't really, you know, a hardcore comic book fan until, you know, like 1984 or so when the Transformers cartoon came out. And, um, you know, that was a magical time for kids, you know, like that, that was just a cartoon that was next level. I became quickly obsessed with all the toys. I was buying the transformer toys. And then, you know, one day I was in Bradley's and there was this three pack, uh, they used to do these like three packs to kind of get you hooked of transformers one, two, and three. I was like, oh, I got to have the comic book that goes with these toys that I love. And I got it and I was, I was reading, it's great. And then the third issue, Spider-Man shows up. I mean, maybe they're trying to sell more Transformer comics. I don't know what the impetus behind that was to put Spider-Man. Spider-Man in a Transformer comic? Yeah, he's in like Transformers number three of the original Transformers things. And he swings in in his black suit and he's battling uh, Megatron. And, you know, it, it's crazy. But as a kid, all I could get out of this was, why does Spider-Man have a black suit? You know, because I've seen Spider-Man many times and he's in Spider-Man, his amazing friends. He's on set, you know, on the electric company and he's always got like that red and blue suit. So I was like, I got to check out why Spider-Man has this black suit. Um, and so, you know, I was a collector because I was collecting these Transformer toys. And so that brought me to pick up Sp amazing Spider-Man, I think it was 287, which is in the middle of this uh, this gang war storyline. And he's standing over Daredevil, and he's like, stay down, Daredevil. Uh, you know, and, and I was like, this cover is great. And I started reading. I was like, oh, I do love Spider-Man. And so I, I picked that up. Um, but because I picked that up, I wanted to know more about Daredevil. And then I picked up a Daredevil comic. And I think there was some like appearance, oh, shortly thereafter by Wolverine. And I was like, who are these people? So flash forward six months later, I'm getting like 15 titles a month, <laughs> um, you know, but then flash forward another six months, I'm getting 50 to 60 titles a month uh, because I became obsessed with like the whole Marvel universe. And back in the eighties, there used to be all these, there used to be these places where you could do subscriptions at 50% off cover price. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, it was like mail order and they'd send you it once a month. I don't know what their margin was, what their discount was, but comics at that point were mostly about a dollar. Um, so I was getting comics for 50 cents. So I wasn't buying music. I wasn't buying anything. I was buying comics and I was you know, beyond hooked. Uh, so like, <laughs> so like that was like, it was, it was my addiction. And um, I used to get something called the comic buyer's guy, which was a weekly newspaper that came out. Uh, and so, yes, yeah, so I was just, obsessed with the medium and um you know I, I was definitely more of a marvel person than a dc person but you couldn't love comics and not pick up batman which then meant if there was a robin spin-off series you had to get that and oh right. and then superman's gonna die so you might as well get that for like two years um <laughs> so you know it, it was it was it was a great time for me you know like the mid 80s to the late 80s early 90s to get involved in comics and then when I was in college, um, I interned down at Marvel and uh, oh. in the editorial department, which was down in New York City, which w was just amazing. So I was working with the people who were doing, um, at the time, the Midnight Suns, uh, so like Blade and Ghost Rider 299, um, Doctor Strange. So we were doing all those through our office. And I also got to work a little bit with Bobby Chase at the time who was doing the incredible Hulk with Peter David on this epic run. Um, so yes, yeah, so like that was for me, um, a transformative experience. I was like, ah, when I graduate from college, I am going to be, uh, you know, I'm going to be an inker because that was where I thought my art was at. 
I mean, maybe I could have been an anchor. I don't know. But I was definitely going to be a writer. I was going to move to New York. I was going to write comics. I was going to try to be an anchor. And um, then as I stayed in college, I was also a film major. And I started getting into film a little bit more. Um, but I was still probably going to move to New York and do the comic book thing. Uh, and then I got a job offer out in Los Angeles from a company that was going to send me to France and be part of the Cannes Film Festival. And I was like, oh, okay, they're going to pay me to relocate out to Los Angeles. And you know, I'm 22. I'm going to have a job in the film industry and start hobnobbing with people. I was like, I am out there. Um, <laughs> You know, like, I, sorry, I can't turn that down. Of right. course, you know, like that, that job, uh, by the time I got across the country, my salary had dropped a hundred dollars a week. Mm. Uh, you know, you know, and like there's all kinds of other things, but it, it got me out to LA where, you know, where I've lived since then. Um, and, and I worked in animation for a while. I created a show called horrible histories. Um, but you know, in the back of my mind, I always wanted to get back to comics and, um, it was just after, you know, years of working in the industry and coming up with White Ash as a project. And I was like, this is going to be a hard sell. And even if I can get it made, I don't know if it's going to be made the way I want it to be. So why don't I use the contacts that I've made working in the animation and, uh, you know, see what we can do and uh, see, just see if people are interested in doing it as a comic book. And, um, you know, from there, that kind of just, it took off and White Ash brought me to Scout and uh, working with them as a creator um, through a variety of things, uh, just craziness. I ended up being taking over as co-publisher after six months of them talking to me about them putting out my book. So, uh, so now, you know, I'm helping run that company, but um, yeah, at my heart, I am just a, a creator making comics and just thrilled to be able to make them the exactly the way I want to because Kickstarter gives us the luxury to do that. Um, so yeah, so like that's, that, that, that's kind of the story in a nutshell, but uh, you know, I've done lots of different things um, in other things outside of comics, but it was kind of like a 20 year detour working in animation film and, and other things to get back to comics. Uh, and I think people usually go the other way. And I was like, uh, just gotta, you know, work on this TV show for a little bit and then I can go make some comic books. Um, <laughs> yeah. I love it. That is an awesome story, man. That's got a lot of grit to it. You know, I, I, I think I've just been, I've been really lucky and I've gotten to sort of kick the tires in a lot of different things. Mm -hmm. I think, you know, people work hard at trying to break into animation or work hard at trying to, to, to break into, you know, film I worked in I edited a documentary at one point on ragtime piano playing so you know like I've done lots of different things and I, and I think that's you know, I, I know how fortunate I am to have gotten to do all those things and to be accepted into um, you know into into each field because I think you know you, you have to pay your dues you have to get to know people you have to be accepted um, and I don't think I was accepted anywhere as quickly as you know the comic book industry it, it was very opening and welcoming when i started bringing my stories around and you know i'll be eternally grateful for 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 um how not not that i say that it was easy but that there weren't the barriers that i was expecting to be embraced um and and so you know i i try to to help other people in kickstarter i try to you know help other creators out as much as I can, because I, ju I just think that the community has been so good to me. Um, you know, I like to give back where I can. Okay. Excellent, 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 excellent. So can you uh, break down a little bit more information about this book? I know you sent me um, the PDF of Glarian and I loved it. It's, it's fantastic. Uh, you sent me a couple other covers. Um, uh, different titles or whatnot. Um, and I believe you said that, <clears throat> well, I'll let you explain. Go ahead and uh, tell us about well, what you said. So, what so you know, this is a character that uh, we met in, um, depending on whether you're through Scout or, or through White Ash, it was either issue three or issue, if whether it was on through Scout or Kickstarter, three or four. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, we meet her for the first time, um, one, one of the characters, Thane, he's running home. And there's just this trail of bodies 
and he is desperate and worried about his wife, uh, this woman, Clarion. And then he finally bursts into their bedroom and there are bodies piled everywhere. And there's this probably five foot three, five foot four elf with a sword who's like, hey, honey, how was your day? Because she is just, um, in the White Ash universe, she's the most dangerous creature that there is. I mean, she is, uh, like I said, she's, she's Red Sonya, but as an elf, so even more powerful. And, um, you know, we, we, we'll learn a little bit more about her throughout the series in terms of why she is so powerful. Um, but she's also the mother to one of the main characters in, in White Ash, and um, you know, and then something horrible happens in 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 that issue. Uh, so everything that we've seen is a kind of a flashback that you know, like in the White Ash um, universe, all the stories we're yeah, it's, Red Red Sonia is a, as an elf is, is a bit terrifying, um, <laughs> and, and and she is like if you see and like so we put out a one shot through Scout. Um, uh, we we put out a one shot through Scout. Um, which is basically three stories told throughout the ages. Um, and, and, and the one common denominator is there's lots of carnage. Uh, you know, many bodies hitting the ground. Um, we, we released it just for uh, Valentine's Day. And I like to think like that those three stories are kind of um, a, an arc of showing the love between Glaring and, and, and her husband, Thane. And, and, and just, so the one shot is the backstory to, the, to this character. The, the mini series, uh, that we're doing now um, is more when, like I said, when she's 22, when she's just coming into her own, when she's sowing her wild oats. Um, so, you know, she is a primal force. Uh, White Ash as a series is probably, I would say, PG-13. Like, I like to think the two leads are PG-13 characters in a PG-13 movie where a couple of R-rated characters come to visit occasionally for White Ash. But Galarian is one of those R-rated characters, so her book is an R-rated book um, because she embraces every aspect of life. Um, and so we're going to see that in, in, in the, um, in, in the mini series and just like the arc that she goes through as, as, as she's kind of, you know, it's, it's that her hero's journey. And so she has to get knocked down a peg or two in the beginning before she can climb back up. Um, but I think what really makes the series interesting is that we're being, as, as we keep flashing forward, um, and, and we're seeing the whole thing through the eyes of this woman in 1970s New York. And we're going to try to see how those two things are, are related. Um, so, but yeah, uh, you know, I, I like to think, you know, you, you have your power levels in, in, in your Marvel universe, you have your Hulk, you have, you know, your, you know your, the equivalent of the Superman, you know, but then you just have those characters like Batman always seems to win his battles. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, she, right. she is the warrior who never loses, no matter you know how big the foe, how strong the foe, because she's either just fast enough or lucky enough in the moment and always skilled enough. Um, so you know, if you saw like Legolas in, uh, I guess it was like more like the, the Hobbit, yeah, where it really showed him kind of unleashed, and um, yeah, and I guess a little bit in Lord of the Rings too. She she is of that ilk, but I would say you know. Once she reaches her prime, she's even more skilled mm -hmm. than he is, especially with a sword. Um, so uh, I see a question from Jay who's asking about working in comics and film industry. Was there anyone famous from either industry that you were honored to meet or work with? Um, so I'm going to answer that question. And I'll say the one time I've ever been starstruck was probably not the biggest star. Um, the most starstruck I've ever been was I got to work with um, William Catt. I don't know if you know William Catt, but he was also known as the greatest American hero in a TV show that was in the 80s. And as a kid, that was, you know, that was the show that made me fall in love with superheroes. And I got to work with him on a film in the early, late 90s, early aughts, somewhere around then. And I was a, I was a PA and they assigned me, they said, hey, you're gonna be Mr. Cat's driver, but we know you're a little weird about him, so we don't want you to speak to him. I was like, <laughs> oh, okay, I, I can't, can't, can't speak to Mr. Cat. Um, and then he gets in the car and he says, you know, it's like, un unlike some other people who I got to, to work with, you know, he like sits in the front seat, he's not pretending my, 
like my 19, uh, 87 Volvo station wagon was a, a limo and he climbs in the front seat with me. He's like, Hey, nice to meet you, Charlie. I, I hear you're not supposed to speak to me. Uh, <laughs> um, so I'll do all the talking for the two of us. Um, but he, he was just like the friendliest guy. Uh, um, and, and so that was a great star sighting. Um, oh yeah. So if you, you, you know, William cat, he, he could not have been nicer, Jack. Um, in terms of, um, big name celebrities. Uh, yes, I've gotten to meet a lot. Um, I was really like, I, I think probably the biggest collection of celebrities I got to meet was, um, I sat in on table read for uh, meet the Falkers back in the day. Mm -hmm. And I was helping out with that a little bit. So it was, uh, you know, Ben Stiller, Robert De Niro, Barbara Streisand, um, Dustin Hoffman, all, all in a room together. So I would say like, that's, you don't, you don't get much bigger than that for an assembled group of talent. Um, but, uh, you know, so I'm, I, I've gotten to know a couple of people. Um, but yeah, um, I think the other great celebrity sighting I had was a friend of mine, uh, who I've worked with before. She's a film director and she's a good friend of Pam Greer. Um, oh, wow. and so, you know, she, she invited me over and, um, cause she was helping Pam with a, she was working on an autobiography and, uh, you know, I, I walk in and, 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 and there's Pam Greer and, uh, you know, had lunch with them that afternoon. That was great. Um, so, so yeah, I mean, I think living in LA, you see a lot of people, occasionally you get to know some people. Um, and I've been fortunate enough to get to know some people and to, uh, you know, meet a lot of people as well. So, uh, in the comic book, in the comic book field, um, I am, you know, just, just getting to know some people now. Uh, I, I know a lot of artists who are not Marvel artists, um, but, uh, or DC artists. And I know a lot of independent artists, so it depends on, on what, um, on who you're talking about. Uh, but, um, you know, I'm getting to meet more and more every day. And obviously, you know, working at Scout gives me um, access to some more people in terms of working on covers and things like that. Um, I had uh, Nick Robles, who's been on Dreaming recently and uh, did Dr. Mirage over at Valiant. He did a White Ash cover for us. Um, he, he's a great guy. Um, you know, and even... Um, so yeah, so I, I'm looking forward to meeting more people in the comic book field, but I have been fortunate enough to meet um, a lot of crazy celebrities, a lot of good celebrities, um, and uh, you know, they're people with uh, all the good and the bad that people have. So, man, you have had a very uh, experienced gig. Well, I've had an interesting life, like I said, um, and, and and I always I will say that I've been privileged to have it. Uh, I mean, I got to work on an animated series um, called Horrible Histories that I helped create around the same time that uh, Scholastic was doing Clifford the Big Red Dog at um, the same studio. Mm -hmm. um, so um, I was uh, the producer on that show and also a writer on it uh, and the voice director. So like I, I got to work with some amazing voice talent, um, Cree Summer, who was great. She was a Penny from Inspector Gadget. She was also on In Living Color back in the day. I mean, uh, I don't know, what was the, the Cosby Show spinoff? Um, different world. Different world, yeah. Um, so, uh, so she was great. Jess Harnell, Billy West who was one of the voices of Ren and Stimpy at one point, Fry and Futurama. So I've gotten to work with some, some amazing voice talent. Um, yeah, it's, it's, I, I think it's just been an interesting journey. Um, and I'm thankful for all the people that I've gotten to meet along the way. And like even today, this is great. I'm talking with you. I'm having someone draw a character that, that I created. I mean, look at this. I mean... This is an experience that not most people get. 
Mm-hmm. Um, and, and, you know, I'm, I mean, this is episode 134. So at most 133 other people have ever had this experience. Uh, yeah. that, that's a, that's a very good point. We've been, uh, we've just been doing this show a little bit over a year, March, 30, yeah. March 26 was our one year anniversary. And, uh, so, you know, I, I think, I think it's important in life to sort of recognize what comes to you. You, know, mm-hmm. you work hard for things and you try to make them happen, but gosh, you got to appreciate the things that happen as they do. Um, and you know, I, like I said, I couldn't be happier than to, to be here today with the most enthusiastic man in comics. Uh, obviously one of the most skilled people in comics as well. Um, so you know, it's, it's a great combination. Yeah. So well, I appreciate that very much. So I'm, I'm, I'm definitely having a blast drawing this character. This has been, um, this has been a very fun piece to do. Try to figure out how to get everyone in here. Um, I have a uh, Russell notes his character already drawn because he was on the show, but mm-hmm. before we did this thing, so yeah. this area back, back here for his character. Mm-hmm. Um, but just the char- the the cast of people that I have met from this. From doing this one thing with with uh, Wizard World, uh, because that panel you guys were all on was wicked cool. Um, you know, I'm always trying to learn from other people that have you know been in the industry and doing things, because uh, we're always trying to get better, increase our own audiences and things like that. Uh, but then to be able to have you guys all on the show and just you know just listening to you talk about all these years of experience and everything that you've gotten to do and explored and like that's an amazing journey and i don't know if that uh if that doesn't like cheer somebody on like man like let me dive into this stuff right here um i don't know what does well and, and i think also um you know the, the thing that i i you know i would definitely pass on is that um you know i i came to comics in you know obviously i've always been doing you know and loved comics but actively trying to break into to comics to do things in the comic book you know world in 2017 Mm -hmm. you know so like for for me you know that's that's you know a little over four years that i've been working in comics and so you know to be able to do the things that i've done to be able to build the following on kickstarter um coming without you know a network in comics um, I just, I know that's difficult, but I also think it, it, hopefully it is inspiring to other people to show how Kickstarter can democratize the process. So you can find an audience, even if you don't have a big name in comics. So, you know, you can find people who will respond to your work and, and, and use that as a place to kind of, um, you know, to build on. And, um, you know, I, I didn't have uh, a big social media following when I started on Kickstarter, I didn't have, um, um, you know, like, so, so for me, it, it was the Kickstarter kind of helped me build an audience, um, and, uh, to, to gain legitimacy in the world of comics. Um, so hopefully that is inspiring to people in the sense that it, you know, Kickstarter helped me, you know, make sure that there were no barriers that I, you know, like there was, I wasn't trying to access, um, I didn't need to find an editor. I didn't need to, you know, like to, 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 to have a publisher help me make things happen. Um, Kickstarter let me do it on my own. Um, and, and so I hope, you know, like that's, you know, what people can take out of this. Um, you know, we all bring our own skills to whatever we do. Um, and obviously I've been, you know, working as a writer on and off for many years now. Um, so it's you know starting as a writer is not something that I just started in 2017, um, but I I think um, you know if 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 people want to kind of be inspired by that panel, that's what I would say to take from um, is you know that Kickstarter for me has let me get the kind of stories that I wanted to tell out to people, um, and and then that panel in a sense was you know me trying to share some of my audience with um you know with other creators there was there was a variety of creators some people had um big following some people had slightly um slightly smaller followings who were up there 
And, you know, we were trying to kind of replicate a little bit in a live show what people sometimes do with backer updates. Hey, check out these other cool projects. Um, yeah. Okay. You know, you know, and cause like, I think if you do that in a backer update, that's often the best way to get other people to, to, um, find new projects. Um, but I wanted to kind of just level that up and take it to, you know, uh, the next stage where we could, we could all talk about comics, make it a show that people would enjoy. Um, and, you know, give something back, but also have my audience get introduced to some other great books. Uh, and I think that's, what's great about the Kickstarter community also is how supportive they are of each other, because unlike the direct market where there's only so much shelf space, um, and, and publishers are sometimes fighting for that. Kickstarter has this infinite shelf, right? So, yeah. it's, you know, it's, it's the more people that come, the better, because when they back my project, they're going to see recommendations for other projects, mm -hmm. you know? And it's so, so people always ask me like, how do you feel about Keanu coming to the platform? I'm like, it is great. You know, mm -hmm. there's three or 4,000 people that had never backed a comic book on Kickstarter before. And now they're going to get emails and, you know, so it's like, it's an, and it's the same thing. He's bringing people to the comic book shops when, when so when, when boom comes on or when IDW or dynamite, they are, you know, they've legitimized the platform for the people who are indies. Um, and that's why, you know, the more big names that come, um, the more you know, legitimacy is given to the platform, which is better for everyone who's doing books on there. Mm -hmm. um, so, so yeah, so I, I I feel like you know we really accomplished that with with the panel in terms of uh, getting some getting different eyes uh, on different books, and you know I, I love the dancer, I love um, Impossible Jones, um, uh, Ichabod Jones, you know like there's there's a variety of Joneses uh, <laughs> yeah. that were up there, uh, you know Immortal Swordsman. So you know I, I think you had a really nice cross section of creators and different types of projects. Um, yeah. Yeah. So, uh, I absolutely agree with that. Cause like, I mean, just looking at these characters right now, like they look very different um, and they come from different worlds or whatnot. And if I wasn't the guy drawing this, if I was watching the show, I'd be interested in who these characters are and seeking them out. It's one of the reasons why um, I wanted to do this show. Um, the more and more I met more people, I was like, man, there's just so many comic books out here that I was completely unaware of. And like, I'm getting to sit down, like you said, and sit down and have this chat with people drawing their character while learning about the character and chatting with our audience. And um, it's just been a blast doing that and learning so much about seeing these different characters and stuff. Well, I also think with that, you know, we're at a little bit of a, a golden age when it comes to um, self-publishing mm -hmm. because the costs have come down. You know, be, I, I think those were like the printing costs were always the barrier. And, okay. um, you know, obviously like if you're an artist, you can always draw your own book. So if you're just, a, you know, if you're just a writer, you, you need to find an artist to partner with and you, you may need to, you know, hopefully you're paying them uh, in addition to, you know, whatever, royalties or money you're making off the book but um just the, the general cost of creating a comic book and printing one used to be prohibitively expensive for for someone to try it and that's why you needed to have a publisher um and i think you know that's no longer the case and you know there's, there are places that do small print runs large print runs um you know i i was able to do an 11 by 17 not 11 uh, like a slightly oversized, but an 11 by eight hardcover uh, of the first volume of White Ash and mm. print up 1,500 copies. And I have no idea how much that would have cost 15, 20 years ago, but I'm sure it would have been two to three times as much. Um, right. You know, and that there was no way as an individual you'd ever do that, but Kickstarter can give you the funding and there are printers and with digital art, you know, it just, it just makes the process so much easier. Um, I know, uh, you know, just like watching you draw right now. I mean, it's, it's a wonderful thing for us to be able to do this in real time. When I was interning at Marvel, you know, the artists used to, they used to get FedExes in every day of pages, mm -hmm. right? Like, like that's how, that's how it used to happen. You know, if, if you wanted to share your page, maybe you could take a picture of it and fax it, but no one wants to run 
you know, a nice piece of artwork through a fax machine, right? <laughs> right. Uh, so like if you wanted to get it to someone, it had to be overnighted via FedEx or two day via FedEx. And so, you know, the, the pencil art going to the inkers and then to the letterers, like that was just such a, um, a process that had to happen. And that's what a lot of the interns did at Marvel. You were, y- your job was opening and sending FedEx boxes. Mm. <laughs> so you got to see a lot of those pages of art. Um, but it was just so much more complicated. And again, you know, what, what people, what people are able to do um, now via clip or Photoshop or, you know, what, what, what do you draw on? Is this uh, I am using procreate right now. Procreate. Yeah. Okay. You know, which is like, basically I'd say most people are doing clip procreate or Photoshop, um, you know, just to be able to send files to look at things in real time. Uh, Connor, the artist who I've worked with the most on white ash, um, he, uh, you know, he, he strong, he used to stream on Twitch for a while. And again, like it, it, it made it really easy for me as the writer kind of check in and, you know, not that I would ever kind of backseat draw because I think that would drive anyone crazy. Um, but you know, like as he's doing his layouts, if there was something that, you know, was missing the beat or missing the joke, I could have that on the background and I can look over and say, Oh, Hey, um, what if we highlight this? Cause it'll be important later on before he got too far into it. Um, so it got to be more of a collaborative process in a way that we could have never done. Um, you know, even five, five or six years ago. Um, so, so yeah, I, I think like all of these different things are, are democratizing the, the process of creating comics and, um, you know, just increasing who, who can create comics and, um, making it easier for people to be seen, making it easier for editors to find them for, for bigger jobs. Um, so yeah, I, I think, I think it's a really exciting time for both independent comics. Well, mostly for independent comics. I think, uh, mainstream comics with, with, uh, the way the industry is also constantly changing, um, and distribution and things like that. I think that's getting a little bit more dicey for some of the larger publishers. Um, but, but I think for independent comics, we're really in a golden age right now. Mm. So how many more stories do you think? Yes. Uh, well, not exactly for wizard world. Uh, so, Charlie and several other creators were on a panel for Wizard World, um, and uh, Victor Dandridge was um, doing the moderation for it and had the crazy idea of putting all the characters on one piece that they can give up uh, with their Kickstarter. And so we're doing the finishing touches on that now. So with uh, Victor billing himself as the hardest working man in comics and you being the most enthusiastic man in comics, um, do you have like the rest of your team filled out? Like the bravest man in comics, the shortest <laughs> man in comics? Uh, no, because uh, a lot of people aren't as uh, <laughs> as loud and outgoing as Victor and I are. Um, <laughs> well, we, then you can get the meekest, meekest person in comics. Exactly. Uh, Vic and I, well, we still do. And when the world comes back to normal, to some degree, we, we hit the convention circuit hard, me, Victor. Victor and I are, and our brothers, we all travel to comic book conventions. We normally go to a lot of shows together and we just kind of like fade off this energy off of each other. Uh, we're not, we're not quiet people at comic book conventions. Uh, when we go to shows, we really don't see the point in being yeah. quiet. It's, it's a promotional <laughs> event. Yeah, it's, of course. It's for networking. It's for conversation. Yeah. It's for geeking out. Um, our priority when we're at shows is that if people like, we want people to remember who we are. We want them to have a good time. Um, Yes, we love making money. We love selling our product. Uh, but the thing is, at a convention, it's all about the memories and good times. And if people are having good times and they enjoy you, based off our experiences, they buy stuff from you. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, for sure, for sure. I, I, I think you have to, you have to be the salesman, um, and but you have to be the friendly salesman. Yeah, uh, I, I always say that like when people when you people ask me about Kickstarter videos, I say they're helpful, but they're helpful if you do two things in them. You, you know, you want to come across as someone that people can believe in, that they're going to, you know, that you're going to deliver something uh, and also that they like you. Mm-hmm. Right. And I think, I think it's the same thing when you're, when you're selling something, you want to be likable, but you don't want to just be likable. You want to come across with, I'm not only, 
like a great guy, but I actually have something good for you too. Right. You know, you're not buying this out of pity. You're buying this because you're going to get a great comic and you like me. So, um, yeah, I, I, I could see you guys pulling that off. Do you guys do any West Coast conventions at all? Dude, that's what sucks uh, because that's the direction we were heading in. Victor has been out to some, um, he's been out to San Diego Comic Con before mm -hmm. and stuff like that. Uh, but before the pandemic hit, my right. comic book, my convention career was really building up. I was getting invited out to other shows. I was hitting closer to the center of the country. And I, like that was my goal. By 2021, I would be in California. I'd be on the West Coast um, of the country because I hadn't been out there yet. So uh, the wheels got halted a little bit right there. So I'm, I'm excited to get back and get that plan back into motion. Well, I, I, I hope to see you at San Diego at some point. Uh, I've had a table there the last couple of years, which has been incredible. Um, um, it's, it's, it's a great place to, I mean, obviously one of the most insane conventions that you can attend. <laughs> uh, and, and I was insane. That was the first convention I did. Um, but, uh, <laughs> um, but yeah, I, I just had a blast there. So I hope to see you at some West Coast conventions. Yeah, and I hope that. so too, man. Um, it's definitely on my radar of things to do. Um, there's still so many people that I have not come across that I've not gotten to pitch and show my book to. So um, the West Coast is nothing but untapped potential for me right now. Well, I, I've also heard that uh, ECC is one of the best to go in terms of like um, – independent creators. Oh, really? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Like, um, like San Diego is good to get your, your stuff seen by TV people because it's, it's almost as much of a, of, um, well, maybe even more of a multimedia convention than it is a comic book convention. But as an independent creator, if you want to sell things, um, that's Emerald city comic con. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, I just hear tales of people selling out on the Friday of everything they brought with them. Wow. Um, yeah. Just, just because that, that community really supports the independent creator. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and they go to the, com they go to the convention looking to support the independent creator. Well, so that is always good to hear. Um, yeah. like I said, we did, uh, I, again, before the pandemic, I did blurred con, um, in Washington DC and I'd never, ever been to that show before. And that ended up being like the best show, that I've ever had, like just mm. engagement, interaction, sales, the whole thing. And um, that was like kind of the kickoff of like, we've been doing comic book ventures for a while. Um, not nearly as long as you, but we've been in there and like trying to learn, try to figure out how to do things. And uh, those, those, the, that year before the pandemic, things were starting to click. You know, we were, you know, we made mistakes, uh, of course, but then, you know, we had successes and then like, things were starting to open up and we were about to, we were starting to connect the dots. So I, like I said, I'm very thirsty to get back to comic book season. Well, I, I think that's going to be happening sooner rather than later. Um, I, I feel like this December is when like the, the, the floodgates possibly are going to open. Um, I, I know that there's a lot of conventions scheduled for December right now. Um, we'll, we'll see whether they, they stay scheduled. I'm hoping they do. <laughs> I'm hoping that we're in a place where it's it's safe to be at conventions, but um, end of this year, it looks like that's going to be happening. So well, that would make me very freaking happy. Um, you know, how many shows on average do you do a year? So you know, I, I live out in Los Angeles, so yeah, that's great. <laughs> hey, see, he's filling out your team. Yeah, he's he filling is. out the team. Yeah. Uh, um, you know, right now I've only been doing a few, uh, I do some of the, the bigger ones here on the West coast. I do, uh, San Diego. Mm. Um, I do, uh, WonderCon, and that's in Anaheim. Um, and then I do LA comic con. Um, I was looking also looking to kind of expand this last year and then the pandemic shut it down. Uh, I was planning to do, um, come out to New York for New York comic con possibly go up to um to emerald city um but we'll see we'll, we'll we'll see how it goes uh i i you know married with a couple of kids so it's always kind of like hey 
can I go away this weekend? Is that uh-huh. the best choice? You know, a little bit of a negotiation. Um, right, right, right. You know, give and take. Well, if I'm going to go away with this weekend, you're going away next weekend. And uh, do I want to have a weekend at home just with me and the kids to justify <laughs> me going away for a weekend without the kids? But uh, it's, so. it's all work. <laughs> yeah, it is work. It is work, <laughs> especially my kids, who I love, but they are work. Um, <laughs> Yeah, but I think I think I think anyone who's a parent kind of understands that that give and take, and they like to take. Um, but <laughs> oh yeah, I, absolutely. A kid sees it; they they're going for it. Got the uh, the, the the devil lighting going on over here. I left the uh, <laughs> the curtain, oh, in. you can yeah. see it's like give give me the the under lighting um, as as the days is finishing here in Los Angeles. It was a hot day today. Um, oh, well, yeah, it was pretty nice outside today. Where, where where are you out of? I am in Columbus, Ohio. Okay. Yeah, we were in the mid to high 80s today. Um, so a little warmer than I like. <clears throat> this is looking great. Thank you. I appreciate that. She had a... Uh, I wanted to really try to work that costume in there together. So now. I'm- yeah. Romana did a really nice job designing that. Um, yeah. Like it's. Uh, I mean, very fortunate to work with a couple of artists who, you know, fashion is also such a part of what they draw. Um, and they love um, spending time kind of delving into the fashion behind, you know, the, interweaving the fashion with, you know, the, the essence of the character. Um, and so, you know, when, when you get questions, you know, and, and reference photos being, do you think this is right? Do you think this is right? Um, um, you know, that's the given kind of give and take that I love. I would agree with that, Andrew. I, I, I would definitely say, I'd say you and Bradley would be fighting for that title. And uh, I, w- I would definitely say J-Man's pretty the most enthusiastic fan in comics. Oh, no. We well, it see. seems like you're going to have a, what's, your, what's your versus show that's coming up. I feel like, you know, we have character versus character. I think, uh, you know, fan versus fan is a natural extension of that. Uh, yeah, actually, that's a very good point. See, see who's the biggest, you know, like you get the fans there. Uh, weighing in on, on, on who the biggest fan is to follow up uh, who the best character is. That's the one thing I can say about the audience that has been watching the support and chat and draw. They are serious indie fans. Like they chase down and and, and hunt after indie comic books and, and they will debate. They will debate it out. That's actually kind of a good idea to try to get a couple of them on here and discuss some indie comics they think are super fun yeah and i also i always really think like that the bar of what is an indie comic also keeps changing i feel like that's also a great discussion to have you know um at one point image was an indie comic uh is image still i mean like is that an indie comic or is is boom an indie comic some people would say yes and you know, and other people would say you know, no um mm-hmm. so I, I feel like that you have to agree on your terminology before you step into the arena in terms of who the indie fan is, um, you know, cause like different people have different ideas. Like there's the people in the comic book shops who feel like IDW and boom are small publishers. Right. <laughs> you know? Right. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I, I think, uh, you know, you want, you want to set the ground rules, um, in terms of, uh, you know, of, of two people enter one person leaves, <laughs> want to make sure that uh, you know that Thunderdome that uh, you know someone's not bringing a um, uh, uh, a protractor to a chainsaw fight, or um, when they're showing off their indie cred, right? You know, and someone can go eight Kickstarter comics deep, and the other person is just like, "Hey, you know, there's this book from Dark Horse called Hellboy. I don't know if you've heard of it because <laughs> I'm a deep indie fan." <laughs> Uh, well, then there's also uh, well, uh, that's also defined in indie. Is it I E or D Y? Mm. 
had that discussion a few times too. Probably depends on what a fan of Indiana Jones you are. Mm. Now that has never been brought to the table. <laughs> yeah. I know for me, like if someone says Indy, that's the first place my mind goes. Uh, you know, Indy, yes, Dr. Jones, I know Indy. Um, <laughs> What's what's your favorite part of the the drawing process? Do you like the inking? Do you like the layout stage? The details? How do you like to approach things? Uh, I am a layout guy. I love doing pencils, uh, but I feel like the energy and fun is in the layouts mm -hmm. because it it sets the tempo for what you're going to be doing for everything else. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> I hate inking. <laughs> okay. I, I am not an inker. My editor uh, has been trying to get me to ink my comic for a very long time. And when I started doing this show, I was doing inks digitally mm -hmm. and told me stop arguing with him. I no longer had an argument. <laughs> so <laughs> not my favorite thing to do, but I will admit doing it digitally is more satisfying. I used to like to, uh, to do brush inking. Like that was, that, that was my thing. Um, just, I enjoyed the interplay of the line widths, uh, mm -hmm. you know, trying to highlight different things, separate the layers. Um, but yeah, I, I think uh, digital has just opened up all kinds of different avenues because it's so much easier to erase a digital line. It, than is. it is something you've laid down in India ink. Um, yeah. It definitely is. Um, and that's, you know, it, there's more security in it. And I'll, I'll be the first one to admit that um, because it's just, uh, inking is just a, a game of patience, man. Like to do it traditionally, it really is. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I, I applaud traditional inkers very much so. Uh, yeah, I, I saw someone doing some inking the other day where they were ruling straight lines with a brush. With a brush? <laughs> yeah, doing the panel borders. It was, um, oh, I forget what her name is. Um, she's done some Catwoman, um, some other things. But yeah, she was just doing brush magic where she was literally ruling the pages, you know, ruling the panel borders with a brush. Um, it was incredibly That's impressive just watching her do that very quickly. That's crazy. Yeah. That is yeah. crazy. But I mean, like that's that's how a lot of people used to do it back in the day. Um, right. It's like I'm looking at it, thinking like that's unheard of. I've got to use a tech. I got to use a, a technical pen. Mm -hmm. Straight lines. And you're telling me she's out here just full blown using a brush. Yep. Yep. Um, um, I took a ty typography class in uh, college. Mm -hmm. hated, it. hated it while taking it. <laughs> You know, you get out of college and you're like, well, I'm glad I took it. Why couldn't I see this when I was younger? Oh, sure. I, I, it, they, as they say, you know, everything's wasted on the young. <laughs> you get a yeah. little bit older, you realize, ah, I should have paid attention in that class because I'm actually interested in things now. Um, right. You know, I, I think it's, it's difficult because a lot of people go to college or go to, um, you know, right out of, out of high school and after high school, you're kind of tapped out. Mm -hmm. right? You know, you've just done 12 years of, of structured learning. And now you're going to go pay to do some structured learning. <laughs> I feel you know, like if, if you took a couple of years off and you, you, you're out in the real world and you're like, ah, oh, you know what I want to learn is this. Then you appreciate that time you have, the luxury they have. And when you're paying for it, you actually might go to those classes that you're paying for. So... Yeah, I get that, man. I was um, there was definitely things in college I wish I would have been more open-minded to. Um, when I went to school, I went to the Columbus College of Art and Design, and I'd picked that school because they had the one thing I didn't see at any other school I applied to was a comic book class teaching you how to mm -hmm. do comics. So that was an easy choice for me, but I was kind of uh, arrogant and hard-headed, and if it did not help me do comic books. I didn't care about it. That's that's all I wanted. That's all I needed. Whatever helps me be a better comic book artist, 
and not realizing I needed to pay attention to those other classes. I mean, eventually I got it and, you know, <clears throat> took some other stuff. But if I would have seen that, like my second year in college, I, I would I would have been better off c coming out of college as a graduate than I was. Sure. When I Again, like it's it's sometimes you're just too young to appreciate so many of those things that that you can go back and do. I mean, I'm not saying if I went back to college, there aren't still classes I would blow off. That's really <laughs> it. Um, but uh, you know, there's plenty of classes that I would love to have, have taken again. Um, I took some oil painting classes, uh, which was really kind of an interesting experience because I was coming from that you know background of loving comics and illustration. And they, you know, the, the way they were teaching was, was very much like, you're not drawing, you know, the, the bowl of fruit. You have, this, every canvas was like six feet by four feet that you were working on. So you're working on these enormous canvases. And the teacher would start um, the class and say, all right, you have 30 minutes to cover your entire canvas with paint. Um, because they didn't want you fixating on drawing and rendering that apple. Right mm -hmm. to them, you know, like the rim of the bowl and how it interacted with the light was just as important as any other part of the picture. Right. It was about right. the composition. It was about, you know, what like they wanted you to find what you were drawing as you were drawing your picture. Right. They didn't want you to go in with a preconceived notion of what the thing is that you were trying to draw. They wanted you to kind of just experience um, the whole thing at once. And I hated that. <laughs> <laughs> I, I wanted to draw that apple. I wanted mm -hmm. to draw, you know, like that specific thing. And if like if left to my own devices, they would have come back an hour and a half later and I'd have that one apple done and nothing else on the page um, or on the canvas. Um, so, you know, like, and, and these were the same people who couldn't understand that there was art to be found in comics. Um, oh my who, didn't who didn't understand at the time when I, you know, said, well, maybe Rembrandt would have been a uh, comic book artist if he had been born today. And mm -hmm. maybe he would have been, you know, like he, his, a lot of his, um, his, his, uh, his line work, his brush work actually looked very comic-y. Um, you know, but I, I, I think at different times, there are different styles of art. I mean, there are different ways of monetizing what you do in art. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and I think that some of the greatest painters, rather than just you know, finding patrons and uh, doing portraits of, uh, you know, mostly old men would have found other things to do with their art. Maybe they would want to tell stories. Um, and I always find it you know, shocking when people can't see the true legitimacy in different art forms. Dude, uh, you should have had a conversation with my freaking high school art teacher. Mm -hmm. um, I went to a school for the arts for uh, high school and my teacher, uh, he was the um, faculty lead. So he made all the programming for arts and stuff like that. And so he would get you your freshman year and then he'd allow you to go to another teacher who was Mr. Carver, uh, your sophomore year. And Mr. Carver was like a breath of fresh air. Oh my God, mm -hmm. the art that he taught, like he taught us so many different things and opened up our eyes and everything. But then um, our, our um, senior year, we came back to the main teacher and we were doing the same exact stuff we were doing our freshman year. And it was just like, it was just so closed minded. Um, like we weren't learning that, like, do we already know, like to a degree, we already know how to do plants. Like you need to be showing it. like the stuff that we were learning in um, Mr. Carver's class, stippling the painting techniques and all this different stuff. Like, let's bring that into class. This is like our senior year. Let us explore. We've had three years of foundation. And, you know, that's all we asked for. And um, he wouldn't do it. And I would uh, sneak comic books into my my work. So even though we, because that's all we did, we, we painted plants. <laughs> and um, I would put a comic book on the table. Or else, like, I'd have a TV in the background up with the plants in my still life. And then I'd have X-Men fighting on the screen or something. I would always find a way uh, right, to put right. comic book work in there. And it drove him crazy to the point to where he, he went off and said comic books isn't art. And I'm like, are you are you serious right now? It's like, you really think comic book illustration is not art? And with every fiber of his breath, he meant that, man. And um, well, I, I, I think, you know, it's, it's the same people who, you know, don't think comics are literature. And then 
then Mouse comes out and they're like, well, that's not regular comics. You know, like it, the, those exceptions aren't part of the medium. Persepolis mm -hmm. isn't a comic book. You know, like sure you can name, you know, things that could, um, yeah, these award-winning pieces of literature, but they're, they're not really comic books. You know, they're, they're just like, like they're, everything's always explained away. Yeah. Um, you know, that, that this is the exception to the rule. And, and like, and, and the thing that these people forget is when, you, when you're looking at, um, you know, Leonardo da Vinci's paintings, I mean, just for instance, there were a thousand other paintings at the time that were terrible, mm -hmm. right? You know, which, you know, but we remember the classics. So it's, it, it's the same argument, you know, like, sure, you're just pointing out the classic comics. Yeah, because those are the, you know, some of the best examples of the medium. That doesn't mean that the medium is bad. It's just there are good comics, there are bad comics. There are entertaining comics. There are ones that are, you know, you know, there are ones that you would consider more high literature. There are things that are pop culture, just like there's the same thing with TV. Um, you know, when I first moved out to Los Angeles, most people who were serious, you know, artists didn't want to do TV. TV was kind of like that, um, uh, you know, stepchild, stepbrother medium, you know, like for people who couldn't hack it as screenplay writers, you mm. know, you know, like it was, it was just pop culture. It was, it was comics, right? Um, it was just the procedurals and, you know, but things have changed. And now, now like TV is the place where writers go to play. Um, right. and you, know, you can expand things and, and, you know, there aren't as many movies, like the movies have become the popcorn. Um, you know, movies, are, almost all the movies that are made are these big popcorn movies now, um, you know, for better or worse, but TV, you know, like there's some amazing stories that are being told in TV where if, you know, if you had looked at that 15 years ago, a lot of people would say there's no art on TV. It's, uh, yeah. you know, just this, this pop culture. And then the Sopranos came along when you're like, well, there's that one show, but the Sopranos is basically a series of movies that they're making for television. Right. Um, so I, I, I think people are always snobby because they're trying to protect their own, you know, field. And, um, you know, they, they can only see the bad examples of something. Um, and yeah, there's a lot of pop culture comics that aren't uh, necessarily high art, but they're entertaining. Mm -hmm. Um, just like there's a lot of classic paintings that are terrible that were made for, you know, for commercial purposes. Um, you know, someone wanted a picture of his wife. So he, you know, so he commissioned the painting and the painting's not good, but you wouldn't look at that and say, you know, uh, oil paintings aren't art because there's this terrible painting that was done just to, to make his, you know, make someone's wife or husband happy. Um, so I, I think thankfully there's less of that today because there are more and more examples of, you know, what could be considered um, the art version of comics, mm -hmm. even though it's all under the umbrella of art. Things that the art snobs can consider art, right? Um, and and then you know, like with the more you know, like, and and so over time, things gain legitimacy when there's less things that uh, when there's more things that make it difficult for them to sort of put the entire medium under an umbrella of this is just bad things, right? Um, I mean, you look at like Lichtenstein, right? Um, like he made comics and art. Uh, and people are like, well, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's examining comics. It's, it's self-referential. It's, you know, it's this or that. But at the end of the day, it's still comic book art that sells for millions of dollars, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, I don't care if it's deconstructing comics, if it's turning an eye onto the pop culture art form. He still either blew up or drew a comic, right? And, but that's art. But the, un, you know, the inherent medium that, he's examining is not, I mean, it just doesn't make sense. So um, obviously, you know, a, a, a comic uh, drawn chat podcast is, is not the place you go to debate the merits of comic books or <laughs> art. Uh, so, but, um, but yeah, you know, if, 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 if you're talking to that, uh, if you ever get in touch with that art teacher again and you want some backup, uh, you know, give me a call. I'm happy to get on the phone with him and cite examples of, of things that people deem as, as high art uh, and see if we can go toe to toe. Um, uh, well, 
that is very much appreciated. But uh, I, I got him back. Okay. Yeah, one of my um, one of my close friends who was still going to school, he was a senior there, and um, he'd asked me to come back to talk to the school, talk to the high school students uh, about my school, and um, I had started. Uh, I was one of the founding people at my college that started the comic book club. So we literally got the first official comic book published at CCAD. We mm -hmm. had a comic book club. We were taking a comic book class, and like. You know, it was just great. So when I got to come back in there with the comic book and explain what we were doing, like just watching him eat so much crow was like the best <laughs> thing ever. Cause it's like he couldn't say no to me coming back. I was an alumni and a senior was asking me to come back to talk to the art class about one of the right. top five art schools in our country. So like right, there was right. no way he could say no to that. <laughs> Although he wanted to. Oh, yes. Oh, he absolutely wanted to. But like I said, that crow that he ate uh, looked so good, man. I was like, it, it was something that was definitely four years in the making of mm -hmm. satisfaction. Well, I'm, I'm glad to hear that. I'm, I'm glad you had that moment. I, I would still love to go back and have a moment with uh, my, my freshman year. I worked in the, uh, the art history library, cataloging slides. And, and I had a couple of conversations with with uh, the um, the curator of the, the slide collection at the college that uh, I would love to uh, have now with a little bit more ammunition. Mm. Uh, so. Yeah, it, 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 it would definitely be worth it. You know, you don't always get to get that win, that, that nope. feeling. You don't. But that was definitely one of those times where people, you know, where I've been advised patience is worth it. You know, just focus on yourself uh, and do what you got to do. And, you know, good things happen. Well, I also think, you know, there's, there's a journey to your life and to, to careers. And when I was in high school, I wanted to do comics. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, that was a long time ago. <laughs> it's 25 plus years ago when I was in high school. And, you know, it took me probably 12 yeah. Oh, well, it took me at least 25 years from leaving high school to end up in comics. And now that's what I do. So, mm -hmm. you know, I, I, I think you sort of have to coming back to Kickstarter, coming back to all of this. If, if there's something that you want, you know, sometimes your path will find find your way back there. Um, and that's you know kind of what I've been fortunate enough to have you know, my my journey take me is, is, is back to comics. And, you know, the love that I always, you know, wanted to marry um but we never thought was going to happen and, and and now it looks like you know we're having that uh, romantic comedy ending uh, <laughs> as, as we get to ride off into the sunset together at least um you know we'll, we'll see whether that marriage lasts but at least i'm you know i'm, I'm getting to have it so right I, I i love how you put that that's that's a dope analogy for that I would have to say this has been one of my most challenging pieces to put together, but this has, <laughs> been, this has definitely been good. Oh, good. Oh, very good. Let's see here. Katie says art schools can be so snobby about stuff like that, com about comics and fantasy art. Um, and yeah, absolutely. Um, Shaggy says I use typography every day. My coworkers come to me and ask me what font is, is this because I have so many fonts in my head. It, that's and that's just so crazy. Like, I, you know, every year as making comic books, you know, you learn something new. Like, I didn't appreciate, you know, the anchor. I didn't appreciate the letterer. Um, you know, I just thought it was just like the writer, the artist, and the colors that really sold the book. But when you really get into them, you know, we made our first comic book. I'm like, man, this thing looks shitty. <laughs> I don't know why, but something's off here. And you know, it was just a you know, a gradual buildup. And then when you found people that were um, better at you or stronger than you were at certain things and you started combining these forces, then you start to see what clicked and what what's clicking and what's not clicking or whatnot. But, you know, lettering and inking is so crucial and important. Um, like our, our first book, we did not get it inked um, when we first came out with Hot Shot. And um, eventually, uh, I think two two years later, we finally got to come out with like the version of the number one issue that we wanted. And so we got it inked and I was like, man, it's, 
it looks so much better inked. Like I, I, <laughs> I feel degree, I'm a purist like that. I, I love the pencils on with the inks on there. And like, I just didn't know it at that time. Um, and, you, and you, sometimes you just don't know things until you get that experience and you, you work with somebody that, you know, is good at their job. Well, I, I think it's also not just that they're good, but it's that it's the right person to work with the right person. Mm -hmm. um, Connor, who who I work with on White Ash, uh, he was um, one of the first winners of the Mark Millar Showcase uh, Talent Showcase that he did um, uh -huh. ways ways back over at Image, and um, his work like they they paired him with another winner who was a colorist, and the colorist is a good colorist, but not a good fit for him. Mm -hmm. And together they did not look good in that showcase. So he wins the showcase based on his samples. He does, you know, um, some chrononauts. I think that's the, the, the title like um, work and nothing comes of it because he was paired with the wrong colorist, mm. you know? And so I, I think like finding that right partnership you can have someone who's great at something, but just not great together. Um, and I've been really fortunate to work with some, you know, amazing people who also work well together with the other people that, you know, I've, I've paired them with. Um, and, you know, sometimes people are like, well, why don't you have the same person do everything? And, it, you know, they don't realize how long it takes to make comics. And yeah. when you're, you know, when you're drawing, you know, like, you, like, like you said, you know, like, you don't necessarily love the inking process, but it's also time, right? You right. Know, if you had someone great coming in here who's doing that inking, you know, it's it's not you drawing it again; it's them drawing it again. But if you pencil and ink, you've drawn it twice. Now you're going to come through and color it a third time. It's living yeah. with that piece for a long time, and it's also just the amount of of time that it takes. Where if, if you do this and you pass it on to someone else who's going to plus it, you know, you can get going on the next bit of pencils. And if you're trying to produce a monthly book, having that, um, you know, like, so, so with Glarian, Romana uh, is doing the pencils and inks on it, but she's only doing colors for half the book. Mm -hmm. um, and she's doing the half that's set in Elfheim. And her colors are great. I mean, don't get me wrong, they're great. But it just, it's, it takes so much longer to have to have go through the whole process for every page. But for the stuff that's set in New York, I'm having Finn, who's the colorist from White Ash, kind of do something that's a little bit more grimy and dirty with the book. So it's like a nice contrast between the two. Um, okay. And um, so, yeah, so she does the pretty stuff. He does the dirty stuff. Uh, and, 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 you know, it works, but you know, I, I don't know if, if he was doing her fantasy stuff, if it would look quite as good because I've seen some of her work colored by other people before. And um, it's just like the way she draws, you have to be just the right person to ink it if you want to maximize, you know, what she's doing. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, and I think Finn's doing a really good job with the bits that he needs to do, but I don't know if, you know, if, if I wasn't looking for that specific look for the New York streets, whether he could do the pretty the way that she does the pretty. And so then, you know, is, is her stuff being plussed? Um, so it's, you know, it just comes down to um, finding the right team and choosing the right people for the right projects. You're absolutely right. Um, I had to find the right inker for my book. Um, I've had a couple people ink my stuff and it just did not work. Um, so it's not always just about that person being good at inking. It is a thing of matching tunes, matching sounds together. Um, that helps out a lot. J-Man said, Mike, I know you're enjoying drawing this character. You're a Lord of the Rings fan like myself, and this is looking good. I am a huge Lord of the Rings fan, absolutely, and Legolas is one of my favorite characters. So, yes, I am having fun drawing this character. <laughs> Definitely had images of poses from Legolas as I was going through this thing. Yeah, she. Uh, part of the, uh, the arc in the first book is her getting away from the bow for a little bit. Uh, because it lets her down, but she'll get back to it. <laughs> I think, um, yeah, you can't, you can't have too much elf stuff without a bow. Um, no, you can't, man. No, you can't. You said this one's just about there. 
We're almost, we're real close to wrapping this up. Just got to get that hair in there. Start merging some of the stuff down, actually. There we go. So what was uh, the most impactful comic that you read? As a kid um, or as an adult? I mean, I think you go through different phases. As an adult. You know, I, I think, you know, I, I'll be completely honest. I kind of checked out on a lot of the mainstream books yeah, circa around like 2001, 2002. Um, you know, I, I was still like, I, I picked up Preacher. Uh, I thought that was really interesting because it was something new, something different. Um, but when I started getting back into comics, um, it was really like seeing where comics had evolved. Um, and so I, I definitely spent some time looking at what, uh, Brian K. Vaughn was doing. Um, you know, read his run of why the last man read his want run, of you know, of saga of paper doll, paper girls, you know, like I, so I thought that was really interesting. I checked out monstrous. So like from, for me, I don't know if there's any one comic that I've been looking at, um, you know, more, more looking at the industry as a whole and seeing where things are going. Um, you know, early on, um, Will Eisner was my biggest influence. Um, I loved what, uh, what he did with the spirit, with all the different levels of storytelling, um, you know, and how he really, in a lot of ways helped invent the language of storytelling. Um, uh, in comics and, and, and level it up. And if you look at some of the stuff that he was doing in the forties, some of it still holds up, which is amazing, mm. you know? Um, and just I, when I was just looking at stuff, like he was like, he would break things down. Like um, how do you show the passage of time in a static medium? You know, like he was the kind of the first person who was articulating things like that. And how do you show pacing in a static medium? So analyzing and breaking things like down like that in, in, in manuals in, in the seventies for people to look at it, which, you know, I found fascinating. Um, so as, as a creator, I think Eisner was the person that I really gravitated towards. Um, but, uh, yeah, I, I, you know, I love Spider-Man. Um, I think that was the character I loved the most, uh, but you know, again, we're in such a golden age of of storytelling. I don't know if there's there's any book that um, that I said, "Wow, um, I was just happy that there were so many books, you know, that were being made with amazing art um, and, and 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 great storytelling." I was a little sad that the numbers weren't in the same places that they had been in in the late '90s in terms of you know a bad comic selling eighty thousand copies. <laughs> I wish that was the day. You know, I, I remember where they were talking about like, uh, you know, like, ugh, Iron Man's not doing more than 65,000 copies this month. And uh, so, you know, most, most comics would kill to have that kind of numbers now. Right. Um, you know, X-Men was four or 500,000 for each issue. Um, yeah. Just, just, just different numbers. Um but, but also the, the level of everything is just, I mean, people talk about like classic comics um, and comics back in the day. And I, and I really do think we are in a golden age of both art and storytelling um, in terms of what's being done now, the level of which is just so much higher than anything. You know, the, obviously, you know, some exceptions here and there, but I think the bulk of the titles that come out now are, are just better than, mm -hmm. than what we had when I was growing up. Um, tried to go back recently with some on the buses and I, I wish I hadn't because it was much better, <laughs> much better in my memory. than when I start reading that again, I was like, really? Oh, I thought this was better than that. So. Understandable. I think we're almost there. Uh, looks great. Doing the finishing touches on this bad boy. I'm doing all the, so they're all standing on cliffs rocks and rubble and stuff. I'm yeah. going to fill all that in last um, after I get everybody done, but there she is, sir. Looks fabulous. Get rid of the pencils. 
This was uh, super, super fun, man. Um, let me go ahead and get your link back in there. Thank you, Katie. Uh, you can get pre-orders for this book Yep, right here at the link that I'm plugging in. And you can follow Charlie on his Twitter account, which I'm also plugging into the comments. Oh, wait, that one's still processing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because we're, we're streaming right now on Facebook, Instagram. I mean, Facebook, Twitter and tw uh, Facebook, YouTube, and Twitch. Nice. So it's going across all three of them or whatnot. Um, so actually, I think all I got to do is put Russell's character in here. That's looking great. Looking epic. I uh, appreciate Thanks. it so much. Thank you so much for having me on. Uh, we're doing right by Glarian. She looks amazing. She was fun to draw, man. She was very, very fun to draw. And I wanted to give her proper respect because I, I love, I love the bow and arrow. Yeah, I, I'll send you an issue of the book too when it's done. Oh, thank you, thank you so much. Yeah. All right, so I want to thank Charlie for coming on here and spending this time with us uh, and dropping so much knowledge and nuggets and tell, talking to us about his experience and the wealth of knowledge that he has, man. That has been very, very fun. Just and dude, that's what helped me. Uh, that just carried me through the whole episode was just yeah. listening to your stories that was great well you're the most enthusiastic listener as well in comics so it makes it easy for me to talk a lot awesome awesome so again guys we put the link into the comments there so go ahead and order copies of that you can pre-order it now give charlie a follow onto his twitter uh tomorrow i got i got episodes every day this week except for thursday or wait no i do have one thursday well, I'll update you guys because we got a lot of people coming on this week. We got Agents of the Nerdy on Friday. Saturday is our first Versus episode, so please come check that out because it's going to be all types of fun. And that's all I got. I want to thank everybody for tuning in. Hope you guys enjoyed yourself. Have yourself a good night. I am going to close this out and go get some food. <laughs> I think that I should ask Mr. Watson. I think that I should ask Mr. Watson. 